Hi everyone, my name's Jen, I'm an author and a book reviewer and I'm here today to talk to you about all of the books that I read in May. I have been having a really good reading year so far this year, that's not always for good reasons, distractions from other things going on in my life, but the reading is going well and I have a notebook here with some quick stats which I wanted to mention before we dive into the books themselves and everything that I mentioned will be listed in the description box down below. I'm gonna shimmy over here so that I can insert some pie charts because those are always really satisfying. So, in May, I read 41 books, but to contextualize that because context is important, six of those books were DNF, so really I read 35 books in total in full in May, but 15 of those were books that I was reading for work and those were children's books and were much shorter. I'm not gonna go into those in detail here like at all, but I am gonna highlight three of my favorites from that pile in case you're looking for some good kids books. And so in total, out of the 35 books I finished, 20 books were books that were mine that I was reading for myself from my shelves. I don't keep monthly stats, I just have cumulative stats for the whole year so far. So up until the end of May, I have read from 29 different countries. 51% of my reading is by writers of colour, 12% of my reading is by disabled writers, 72% of the books I've read have been published by small presses, 35% of the books that I have read are translated, and this year so far I have a 15% DNF rate. Life is too short to be reading books that you are not enjoying um, and especially when books are such a huge part of my job. I know my tastes now. I give a book a decent chance and if it's not hitting the mark then I just part ways with it and make sure that it goes to a better home. So when it comes to including DNFs within stats, what I do is if I've read the majority of a book, I will include it as a book that I've read. If I read less than half, then it isn't recorded in my reading stats at all, apart from being listed as a DNF. So that's where we are. So far this year, I have read more, I think this year, let me just get my phone up. I think I've read more so far this year than I read in total last year. That's how ridiculous this reading year is going for me. And it's not because I'm trying to hit a certain goal or anything, it's just, it's just the way life is at the moment. So this year I have read so far 138 books, but page count wise, that's less than the entirety of last year. Page count wise, so far this year I've read 26,000 pages and in 2022 I read 38,000 pages. So yeah, I have read still more books than I was reading this time last year, but a lot more shorter books too. Okay, for anyone who's not interested in stats, sorry. Now we're gonna actually get into the books. Some of these I spoke about in reading vlogs and where that's true, I will link the relevant videos in the description box down below, and some of them I'll be talking about here for the first time. So around the beginning of May, I decided to do a reading vlog trying to find a new favorite thriller. It's something that I'd done before, I think two years ago, I took some books with me um, on a week away to the New Forest and went through them and actually found my favorite book of the year doing that, which was Mrs. March by Virginia Fito. I also read a lot of books that week that I really didn't like, so it was very mixed. This time when I did it, I was more strict when it came to DNFing. So I ended up DNFing half of the books that I started reading, but the ones that I finished, I had a greater success rate with. So briefly, the ones that I DNFed in that video, we had Lucky by Rachel Edwards, How to Disappear by Gillian McAllister, Amrita by Banana Yoshimoto, My Perfect Sister by Penny Batchelor, Blind Goddess by Anne Holt, and The Serial Killer's Daughter by Alice Hunter. And if you wanna know in-depth reasons for why, you can head over to that reading vlog. But here, let's focus on the ones that I actually read. Out of the six that I finished, there was one that I thought was okay, there were two that I thought were good, and there were three that I thought were really, really good. So the one that I felt okay about was Close to Home by Cara Hunter. I had originally picked this one up because it was in a list of books recommended for fans of Nikki French. And this is about a young girl who goes missing in Oxford. It's during a party and the police think that maybe she has been 
taken somewhere quite close to her home. They also don't trust the parents very much at all. I thought this was compelling, but it was one of those books when once I finished reading it, I found I wasn't thinking about it much. And there were a few unbelievable things that happened in this book. I have read reviews for the next one in the series and people do seem to prefer that. It's tricky with series though, because on the whole with series, ratings do go up when books progress in the series because the only people reading them are the ones that really enjoyed the ones before. So they are gonna be more favorable. But in the written reviews, it says that the next book in the series does seem to address some of the issues I had with this book. So I may pick up the second one in the future, but um, if I was gonna recommend thrillers to you, this wouldn't be top of my list. Then I read this, which is The Old Woman with the Knife by Gu Byung Mo, which is translated from the Korean by Chi Young Kim. This is about a, ser a serial killer. I guess she's a serial killer, but she is she's a hired killer. She is an assassin and she is in her 60s now and she thinks she should be retiring. But this life is the only life that she has ever known and she doesn't really know what she should be doing with herself. Whilst this book does have quite a bit of plot, it's more a character study of her. And if I was gonna do book maths on it, I think I said in the reading vlog that I would say, it's like Killing Eve meets Lullaby by Leila Slamani meets the TV show Beef, because a lot of this is about revenge as well and how things can escalate from one moment in time. I enjoyed it. I also enjoyed this, which is Buried by Linda LaPlante. It's the first in her new detective series about someone called Jack Wall, who's a police officer. Bit stereotypical, bit cliched, has some tropes in the make you roll your eyes in an affectionate way because Linda LaPlante leans into these things. She knows what she's doing. She's playing with you. She understands that the reader also understands what she's doing. Jack is a police officer who's, it's not that he's not good at his job. He just doesn't really care about his job very much, but then he gets embroiled in a case that really tugs at him. And there's a lot of parallel things going on in his life. Things come to light, which means that he views his job in a different way. He's also potentially corrupt, you know, ticking lots of boxes. And as I said, I had a good time with this one. It wasn't one that I thought, oh my God, I must go and read the entire series right now. But when I need a book that's gonna be reliably quite a lot of fun, then I will go to the next one in the series. And I don't feel like I need to remember a lot of this book in order to enjoy the others in the series. Then I read All Yours by Claudia Pinheiro, which is translated from the Spanish by Miranda France. This one I would recommend for fans of Muriel Spark. We're now into the three books that I absolutely loved from that video. This is about a woman who's sure her husband is having an affair, so she follows him one night and she sees him kill the woman that he's having an affair with. This happens in the first couple of pages. And she doesn't really know what to do. She sits there and she thinks about it for a minute and she thinks, He's really hopeless at home and he's really bad at cleaning up messes. I'm sure he's going to not clean this up properly, get himself in trouble. That would be really embarrassing. My reputation would disappear. So in order to save us both, I am just gonna clean up this mess for him, but not tell him that I'm helping out because I don't want to encroach too much. It's really funny, but then it gets really twisted and dark. It's not very long. I really recommend that you pick this one up if that premise sounds like something you would enjoy. I also read The Curfew by TM Logan. This was the first of Tim Logan's books that I have read. I have now bought two others and I'm currently listening to a new one on um, audio. <laughs> Why did I forget that word? I'm listening to one on audio, The Mother, which is most recent one. But I was gutted to discover after reading this, because I loved reading it on the page, but I was so sad to discover that the audiobook is narrated by Richard Armitage, which just would have been extra brilliant. So if you haven't read this, run, don't walk to that audiobook, please. I listened to a sample and yeah, maybe I'll revisit it on audio uh, at some point. But I love this book. It is narrated from the point of view of a father whose son misses his curfew one evening and he's lying awake thinking, where is he, you know, as parents do. It's two o'clock in the morning and then he thinks, right, I'm just gonna go and peer into my son's room just in case he came home and I didn't hear him. So he doesn't wear his glasses and he goes and looks in his son's bedroom and to his surprise, his son is there and is asleep. So he berates himself for being overly dramatic and thinks oh, I should just chill out and he goes back to bed. But um, it's not his son in his bed and it goes from there, 
bad things happen the night before and all the parents end up trying to work out what that bad thing was and who is responsible. I did not want to put this book down when I was working during the day. I was constantly thinking about it. It was excellent. My favourite procedural, because that was told from the point of view of, of parents and people outside of the police force, but my favourite procedural I read in that vlog is this, which is The Puppet Show by M.W. Craven. And I have since bought all the books that are available in this series. It is about a detective called Washington Poe, who lives in the Lake District. He is also a disgraced policeman and has been suspended, but a murder victim has turned up with his name on his body. So he gets called back in to try and solve this case. I had quite a few thoughts on this book and I will link the vlog in the description box down below if you want to go and find out more. But in short, I really love this book. It is quite disturbing in places, but I thought it was really well written. I thought the Lake District was such a great character in the book and I look forward to reading more over the coming months because as I said, they're sitting on my shelves. In fact, they're not sitting on my shelves. They're sitting in a pile ready for me to include them in a haul video, but very shortly they will be on my shelves. In May, I bought three books that I'd bought really recently. They were all, I think, in my last book haul. So one is Dear Bear by A. He Lee, and this is a poetry collection. I don't have a huge amount to say about it because it is very, very short, but these are beautiful prose poems that are narrative driven, but still mystical. I would definitely recommend it for fans of Nin Andrews' book, Why God is a Woman. I'll read you a little extract. In the beginning there was a flood. The sea mingled with lakes and the waters became salt pools at the bottom, sweet at the top. Before this beginning we were content with swimming in pool waters. Filters and pre-designed measurements were comforts and it was pleasant to hear the ticking of air bubbles. Some of us looked upon the pink skeletons beneath the ocean, realised they shimmered like shattered church windows. It uses colour really beautifully and is a meditation on how everything is linked. It's also about observation and just a comment on storytelling in general and I thought it was lovely. I also read this graphic novel called Garlic and the Vampire, which I hoped was going to be super cute and it was super cute. If you enjoy K. O'Neill's graphic novels, then may I present this to you. This is about garlic. Here she is. She works on a uh, this garden that belongs to a witch and she has a best friend called Carrot. And then one day they hear that there is a vampire who has come to the local area and they decide that somebody should go and confront this vampire because they don't want him to destroy their neighborhood. And Garlic is volunteered by everybody else as the person who should go and confront vampire because of the law that surrounds her her type. She is a garlic. Vampires are supposed to be very scared of them. She's very afraid though and she doesn't want to go but she decides for the good of everyone she will put on her big girl pants and she will go and confront this vampire. It is adorable. Here we go. You can see what the art style looks like. It's just super cosy. I would recommend it for middle grade and up. I also read Waiting for Ted by Marika Big. I picked this one up in foils. It was one of, on one of their recommendation tables and the premise just sounded so good because it's about a woman who basically lives her life on Instagram and she has been spending all of her money and money that she's inherited from her family on expensive items for their house to make her life seem brilliant. And her husband, Ted, does not like this and he finds it really uncomfortable. He tells her to stop spending money. This book had an intriguing blurb, but the payoff really wasn't there for me. It didn't really seem to know what it was. It, it seemed to be shape-shifting as I was reading it, like it didn't want you to see what it was very clearly. And that could have been effective and playful, but to me, it just felt a little bit messy. So sometimes it really feels like it's set in America because there's lots of references to Stepford Wives and Desperate Housewives, and that's deliberate. But then it's actually set in the UK and we have um, regional accents used, or at least um, phonetics used when people are talking to discuss class. And I think that that jarring was supposed to be there because it was like, aha, you thought it was this, but actually it is this, which is a commentary on social media and perceptions of people, which is what the book is all about. But I, I don't know, it felt as though it lacked a little bit of identity in itself and I found that a little bit off-putting and it meant that as we progressed closer to the end, I didn't feel like I cared too much. It didn't feel concrete enough for me to believe in it it felt as though I always was reading something that was fictional and I couldn't lose myself in it. So this one, sadly, was not the favourite that I hoped it would be, but later in the month I read things that I think were 
what I was looking for when thinking about that premise. So we'll talk about those later because those are the ones I really, really loved. I also read Death of a Bookseller by Alice Slater and I actually listened to this one on audio. I have been anticipating this one for years. Uh, yeah, literally years. Uh, Alice is someone that I have known for quite a long time. She's hosted events that I have done like as, as a writer and we've been in various different anthologies together with our short stories and I love her writing. She's really gritty, dark, twisted. Um, she also runs a podcast with Bethany Rutter called What Page Pod, if you haven't listened to that. I would recommend that too. But yeah, I listened to this one on audio. Let me find the narrators for you. There are two narrators because there are two characters and we alternate between them. So it's Emma Noakes and Victoria Blunt. And I would absolutely recommend the audiobook of this. It was delightful fun. So this is about Laura and Roach and both of them are booksellers at what is Waterstones, but it's called Spines in this. They work at the Walthamstow branch. Roach is really, really into true crime. And I think her first chapter, she goes to a podcast live recording, which is essentially my favorite murder, but it's called something else. And she is just obsessed, but she sees herself obsessed with true crime podcasts in a really deep and meaningful way. Not in the way that people who have just started liking true crime like it. She calls those normies, people who get really excited and don't know their facts. She's an OG. She's been there since the beginning. She's like, no, I take this stuff seriously. I am invested. I would write to serial killers in prison. I will get beneath the dirty surface and exist there. Thank you very much. She also keeps pet snails, which I think is a, a nod to Patricia Highsmith. So there's lots of fun things going on in this book. And then Laura is someone who's just joined her branch. Laura is not into true crime. Laura hates true crime but she does write found poetry based on narratives to do with the victims of true crime she hates how true crime focuses on the perpetrators and um, her and Roach clash heads because of that but then Roach discovers something about Laura and she decides that Laura is going to be her new obsession and I won't say more about the plot, I would just encourage you to read it. As I said, I especially would recommend the audiobook because the narrators are so brilliant. It's one of those books that makes you feel a bit gross, <laughs> um, which I'm sure Alice intended. It makes you feel like you shouldn't be reading it and it's deeply uncomfortable. And especially I think when you're listening to it because it's just worming its way into your brain, I thought that it was really great. And actually when I was reading this, it was when I, was filming a different reading vlog and part of that reading vlog which I'll talk about in a bit was trying to find another book like Notes on a Scandal and whilst this is very different to that I do think it, it scratched that itch for me obsessive female friendships that aren't friendships I enjoyed myself very much and I look forward to whatever Alice is going to write next so let's go there next then as I said I was recording an Anne? A reading vlog where I was in part trying to find a book that reminded me of Notes on a Scandal but the whole video's premise was trying to discover new favourite books by reading books that reminded me of my favourite books and in that video I didn't find a book like Notes on a Scandal that I absolutely loved. I did read two books, I liked one of them and I DNF'd one of them. So the DNF was Mrs S by Kay Patrick which is a book about a matron who starts at a boarding school and becomes obsessed with the headmaster's wife. But the writing style in this, I just didn't like very much. Loads of short sentences that I ended up just finding really distracting. Like some sentences were just one word, two words, three words long, and there would be a lot of that in one go. And it just didn't work for me, unfortunately. I'm sure lots of other people will love this one, but I just couldn't get into it. Then another book that was hopefully gonna be Light Notes on a Scandal was A Good Winter by Gigi Fenster. And this was Light Notes on a Scandal. It's about a woman in her, I think she's in her 60s called Olga, who lives in an apartment block. And another woman who lives in this apartment block is called Lara, and she is obsessed with Lara. Lara is currently looking after her daughter because her daughter's husband died and she's just had a, a new baby. And Olga forces her way into their life. It's written from Olga's point of view, and she convinces herself that other people want her around much more than they actually do. So you're never quite sure if she's describing situations accurately 
Um, and then when you realize that she is twisting the truth quite a lot, again, it becomes deeply uncomfortable. And I like that, but I thought the ending was quite rushed and also it didn't explicitly say what was happening at the end and I think it was because it didn't want to be too disgusting, but I would prefer it to have kept the straightforward tone it had in the rest of the book. But as I said in the vlog, I think that says more about me than the book itself. Also in that vlog, I decided to read books that I hoped were gonna be a little bit like I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel. I'm a Fan was longlisted for the Women's Prize and shortlisted for this year's Jalak Prize and I loved it, super uncomfortable book about toxic online lives and people misinterpreting situations and just being a bit self-obsessed. I read three books in that vlog that I hoped were gonna be like I'm a fan. Two of them I adored, one of them I quite liked but was a little bit perplexed by. So let's talk about that one first. That one was A Touch of Jen by Beth Morgan. This is about a couple called Alicia and Remy, I've got their names there for a second, who are obsessed with this woman called Jen. Remy used to work with her, so he feels like he knows her inside out and he's told Alicia all about her. They follow her on Instagram. They quote her Instagram captions at each other. Basically, she is what their relationship is. They don't seem to have their own identities anymore. Their whole relationship is based on them mocking but also wanting to be this character called Jen. The whole first half of the book is about Instagram existing in real life or them trying to manifest Instagram existing in real life as something tangible. And then the second half of the book is a horror novel because one of the characters starts watching loads of horror movies and that infiltrates into their lives. Basically, it seems like whatever content the characters are absorbing then exists in reality for them. It's a really interesting premise. I did think it was kind of messy, but deliberately messy. I have thought about it a lot and I haven't ever read anything quite like it. So if that intrigues you, then maybe go ahead and pick that up. But the two that I absolutely loved, which were a little bit like I'm a fan, were Idol Burning by Rin Usami. This is translated from the Japanese by Asi Inida. And this is about a high school student who is obsessed with a member of this J-pop band and she calls him her Oshi. It turns out that he's been accused of assaulting a female fan and she cannot connect these realities, like the reality of who he is out in the world and her version of him that exists inside her head and has been a great comfort to her when she's been going through difficult things in her own life. We're not quite sure what's going on in her life, but it's alluded to that maybe she has a chronic illness or a, a disability. And that really spoke to me, losing yourself in fandom when your life is very different to that of your peers, speaking as someone who was, uh, who was a disabled teen, is a disabled adult. I thought that that was handled really, really beautifully and there's a lot of interconnected imagery in this which felt really tidal there's a lot of water imagery and i think that tidal imagery really captured the overwhelming feelings that you can have towards fandom and how it can sweep you away from the stuff in your life you don't want to be atten paying attention to but also if you lose yourself in it, it can feel like you're drowning i love this so much and i also love the subtweet by vivek shreya this book this book is so much fun this is about two women neela and rukmini and neela has been creating music for a long time she feels a lot of disdain towards younger artists who are churning out content and using social media as a way to progress their career she's like i don't need that i'll produce good music i'll send it out into the world and if it tanks then it tanks but if it's good it means it will reach the people rick mini is someone who does use social media she doesn't create her own content actually does she does a lot of covers and neela turns her nose up at this until one day rick mini covers one of neela's songs and rick mini's version of neela's song becomes the one that people know the most. Neela doesn't really know how to handle this. Is she supposed to befriend this person? Is she supposed to hate them even more? What's best for her personally? And also what is best for her career? There are a lot of really interesting conversations going on in this book. And I love how we get to see the same scene from both characters' perspectives a lot of the time. And we'll see how both of them are interpreting the situations in completely different ways and are both anxious that the other person doesn't like them. It felt very real in places whilst also being ridiculous in others. 
so, so good. And I have recently, spoiler, which I'll be talking about in next month's wrap up, I have recently read Yellow Face by Rebecca F. Kwan. And there are a lot of similar conversations going on in those books. So if you have read one and not the other, can I recommend picking up both? Cause they're both just sublime. So I really, really love that. I also really loved How Kyoto Breaks Your Heart by Florentina Lau. This is a book I read cause I hoped it was gonna be a little bit like Tiny Moons by Nina Minya Pals. And it was tonally very similar. This is about Florentina moving to Kyoto and about the breakdown of a friendship. And she's trying to do a post-mortem on this friendship. Why did it fail? And I love that so much weight is given to this friendship. It's talked about in a way that most writers would talk about romantic relationships. I don't think you get a lot of introspection when it comes to friendships in a lot of books and it's needed and this does it. So if you're looking for a book about female friendship, recommend this. Also discussions on Kyoto, food and all of that absolutely beautiful it feels like reading a series of postcards because it's told in snapshots loved this so much then another book i read in that video was out by natsuo carino i was hoping it was going to be a bit like bandit queens by perini shroff which was long listed for the women's prize and i loved it it was like bandit queens but this book i am still so i was gonna say stressed about it i'm not stressed about it i am still torn about it. I love the first four fifths of this book. It's 500 pages long. If I could take out the last 100 pages, I absolutely would. It's about four women who work at a factory. They're creating lunch boxes. And then one day one of the women kills their husband and they call her friends and say, can you help me? I have killed my abusive husband. And they all rally round to dispose of the body, motivated by money rather than friendship. And then other people outside of their relationship get wind of what's going on and start to try and manipulate the situation further. It is really, really dark, very disgusting in places. If you don't want to read about people cutting up bodies, maybe, maybe don't read this book. But I loved it. I thought it was so, so good. And then the last 100 pages had a lot of sexual violence in it. And it felt like someone else was writing the end of this book. It felt as though it was undoing a lot of the work that had happened in the first 400 pages which was just quite disappointing. I am gonna read another book by this author just to see if I prefer that, because I desperately want to love her work, but the ending definitely ruined the rest of this book for me. In that video, it was a long video, I also read Temporary by Hilary Leichter in the hope that it was gonna be like, there's no such thing as an easy job, but a book I liked more. Sadly, I didn't love it. I also read Orpheus Builds a Girl by Heather Parry, which I hoped was gonna be like Poor Things by Alistair Gray. It's about a man called Willem von Tor and his relationship with a girl called Lucy. His narrative is split up and there are sections written by Lucy's sister who claims that she is telling the truth about what Willem did, that he is not portraying the situation fairly. In that respect, it was a bit like Poor Things and there were lots of medical things discussed and bodies examined, but otherwise these books were really, really different. I did like this, but it's based on a real life person and I already knew what this real life person had done and therefore I knew the whole plot and that lessened my enjoyment of the book overall. I also read Chrysalis by Anna Metcalf in that video and this is a book that I loved. It reminded me of The Vegetarian by Hong Kong and also The Lonesome Bodybuilder, which is a short story about a woman who feels invisible so she decides she's going to become a bodybuilder in the hope that people will notice her. This book is told from the perspective of three different people, Elliot, Bella and Susie. <laughs> Elliot is someone who goes to the gym a lot and he sees this woman there who's working out and he starts observing her. Bella is the mother of this woman and Susie is a colleague of this, of this woman. So we get three separate sections, three big chunks, where these characters are observing this woman and talking about her and talking about how she impacts their life. They seem to use her as a form of emotional photosynthesis. They talk about her, some of the characters talk about her like she's a selfish person. So essentially this woman has been building up her body, cutting herself off from society, and is now someone who makes YouTube videos on meditation and encouraging other people to isolate themselves and just think about themselves, take care of themselves. They see this as selfish behavior, 
but she has gone through quite a lot of traumatic things and they don't always have the context for that. It's a wonderful book about disconnection, um, about setting boundaries and how it's impossible to understand what is going on in someone else's life because this book refuses to let you inside this woman's head. We never get to hear from her perspective and I thought that was really interesting and as I said is definitely reminiscent of The Vegetarian because that has the same three perspectives and you never get to hear from the woman that all of these characters are talking about. I love this one. I also, as I said, read 15 children's books for work and I want to highlight three of those that I thought were particularly lovely. All of these are picture books, I would say for two to five, six year olds. The first one is The Roller Coaster Ride by David Broadbent. And this is a picture book about a young boy who's going out for the day with his grandma. He's really hoping to go on a roller coaster and she's taking him to her local haunt from when she was younger where there used to be a fairground ride but she says on the bus it may be shut down it may not be open today I don't know I haven't been there in ages so it's about going on an adventure with a family member but also managing expectations and disappointment which I think is a really good lesson for kids and it also has wonderful incidental representation when it comes to limb differences as well here is one of the uh, illustrations that we've got going on here. I thought this book was really delightful. I also loved Mama Zooms by Jane Cohen Fletcher. This is a book from the 90s and I think the illustrations do feel like they're from the 90s as well but this is a lovely lovely book about how this child feels as though their mum's wheelchair is loads of different modes of transport that she can take him on and it's part of their make-believe playtime and I love this so very much. And the final one that I wanted to recommend was A Fox Called Herbert by Margaret Sturton, which I think is also illustrated by Margaret. Yes, it is. So this is Herbert. Herbert loves foxes, but his parents keep telling him he's not a fox, that he's a rabbit. And then eventually his parents see him playing with foxes more and dressing up as a fox. And when he says adamantly, I am a fox, his parents suddenly realise how much it means to him and say, of course you are. This can obviously be a metaphor for so many different things, but it's just about acceptance and love. And again, loved it with all my heart. So those are all the books that I read in May. I would love to know if you have read any of these or if you would like to now that you've heard me talk about them. If you are new to my channel and you would like to subscribe, that would be lovely. Leave me a comment down below letting me know what you have been reading recently. If you enjoy my content and you would like to consider supporting me on Patreon, that would be very much appreciated. Patreon is a place where you can tip creators from $1, £1 a month. There's a bit of extra content over there, but it really is just to fund my time making free content for everybody on here because I make videos every Sunday or they go up every Sunday and it funds my time making these videos accessible by creating captions as well and support over there is really important so if you would like to support that would be lovely if you don't have the means do not worry about it that is everything from me today thank you for joining me I'm sending lots of love and I'll see you next week